put the kids to bed. We're telling ghost stories tonight. That's right, today I have to share with you one of the Gibson Mod Collection guitars. We've reviewed and demoed so many of these things. I also do the weekly recap, but if there's one that really catches my attention and is special, I pick it up to review and document. Let's take a trip to Ghoul School. I'm really excited to see this one. I think you guys are going to love it. Look at that. <laughs> it's an all white Les Paul custom with only one humbucker. The neck is just gone. There's no toggle switch here. You've got the double white knobs. This is such a cool piece. The only thing that would have made it cooler is if they would have put some kill switches in here. But then you match it with the ebony fretboard and a big old white truss rod cover. The black and yellow case is a really nice touch too, but what if I told you that's not everything that's special about this bad boy? You see that? We've got black sides. But not only that, we've got a white back! So that's pretty darn cool with the white binding and everything, but we've got a stinger at the heel! But that's not all! There's a stinger at the headstock! This was like a, a must-buy, right? <laughs> This thing's cool, and they said it was a satin finish, but no, this feels like a gloss to me. Like, it's not a high gloss, but it kind of reminds me like when I buffed up that satin finish in this episode. And check out the side profile view on this bad boy. You got black and white everywhere. It's the perfect yin-yang thing going on. Even up here onto the headstock, yeah. But, why only one pickup? Let's do a little bit of history behind that, because there is a huge niche market out there for this exact guitar. All right, so back in the 50s, there was a thing called a Les Paul Jr. It was a 1P90 guitar, and generally, it was meant for students because it was cheaper than the full-on Les Paul model. However, throughout the years, rock stars have picked those things up and go, ha, there's something special about this whole 1P90 thing. I really like it. So eventually, in the 2000s, some dealers got the bright idea, how about we do a one-pickup Les Paul custom and kind of blend the juniors with the higher end versions of themselves. A very prominent dealer of that is the Music Zoo because they did just that. They ordered one pickup Les Paul Customs. Sometimes you could find a rap tail, but most times it's like what we have today, a stop bar tailpiece and the two pneumatic. In fact, Jared James Nichols, very famous for using his old glory guitar. It was one of those originally before it was all the Epiphone iterations. But then you also have later creations like the Les Paul Senior, which we documented in this episode, which is a further blending of everything. But you've got like the Kazuyoshi Saito Les Paul with the P90 in the bridge. You've got the Brazilian Les Paul that I documented in this episode. And then other signature artists like Joe Perry had that for the Gold Rush. There is a demand for one pickup Les Paul Customs. Not everybody gets it, but once you play one, you understand why these things end up selling for more than the two pickup iterations, despite being technically easier to do. It all comes down to not having a pickup right here. Now you could say that it's because there's less magnetic pull on here, but for me, it's all about just having the freedom to strum wherever I want. But only having one pickup, you are limited to your tones, but it also makes you focus on using the volume and tone controls to get the different sounds. Now, does this have any coil splits or anything? No, that's something that can sometimes make these guitars a little bit more interesting tonally, but you don't even have to. Sometimes it's just you don't have the option to do anything else, so you have to focus with what your hands can do. Well, what kind of case candy does this come with? Typical warranty evaluation where they tell you all the small little flaws about it. But I noticed this last time I bought a Mod Shop collection guitar. Do you see any score here that's below 4.4? I don't. But for some reason it scored a 4.3. I don't think that's how averages work, Gibson. <laughs> But I suppose they probably do that on purpose, so it's a little bit more aggressive of a scale. And then we just get a COA in here. It doesn't look like we have any other case candy on this particular ghost. So, so far, I'm really pleased with this. Let's get it on the workbench to take a look at its parts and spec. I was initially thinking ghost, but now I'm starting to think more so tuxedo vibe, so we'll just call it tuxedo mask. <laughs> so, our bridge pickup in here, you're gonna notice a double white Gibson pickup? That's really rare. You don't find that too often. And what model is it? They very kindly marked it for us. 500T. And it's a four conductor. Do you know what this is, guys? This is a, a Buckethead Les Paul. That's the only model that I can think of that had the double white, except for the Hot Rod Studios. I think they also had a very similar thing. So 
Why doesn't this have a black kill switch right here? Or like down here, just have a master volume. I really, really wish they would have did that because then I would have had to have kept this thing. But the 500T in here, that's a really hot pickup. It's ceramic and 15.17K ohms within the circuit. But what's equally frustrating here is it's four conductor. They could have put the push-pull pot on here if they wanted to. However, as a guitar demo, we're kind of glad they just let it be. It's a little bit easier for me. But you've got a blacked out Nashville style bridge here, and surprisingly a full weight blacked out tailpiece. Nothing too fancy within our pickup cavities here. And they put these crisp white knobs on here. You also have the pointers. There we go. Very nice clean look on this Les Paul Custom. Now if you really get this in like a different lighting situation and you're looking up close, you can see there's like a little bit of contamination within the finish. It's nothing too overly noticeable. Like here you can see like a little bit of dark smudging, but from a foot or two away it's not noticeable. But we do not have any type of filled in pick guard hole or anything like that. And judging by the fact that we don't have a back plate, for a toggle switch cavity. That means this actually started life. It was supposed to be a one pickup Les Paul custom. So maybe it was a messed up and or an abandoned made to measure. But this is a satin finish. However, it's not like the satins we were talking about in the faded episode. This is very similar to what I felt on the LTD Evertune guitar that we reviewed a couple of weeks ago. I really wish the mod collection could differentiate between this version and then the cheaper satins because they just call them both satins. Whereas this is like, I guess maybe you could call it matte, or maybe you could say semi-gloss. Moving up our fretboard here, we have our Mother of Pearl block inlays. It's a straight up ebony fretboard, very similar as all the other Les Paul Customs we've seen on the channel. Got a nut width of 1.67 inches, that increases to 2.06 by the 12th. First fret neck depth 0.88, and just about 1 by the 12th. Here's that neck at the 1st fret and the 12th fret. Just a nice rounded C-shaped neck profile. Now the headstock also has that same flat finish on it. And you also have the Gibson logo and the custom emblem dump in the Mother of Pearl. And then yeah, you got a blindingly white truss rod cover. It works, and then it doesn't work at the same time. I'm not sure if I agree with that cosmetic touch or not. Maybe if we had a black layer in between, you know, kind of like what they did for the binding here, then it would have looked cool. But get this, these are actually locking Grover tuners. That was a very nice premium spec. And the binding down here is a little bit chewed up. You can see some chatter marks. This one's definitely not the cleanest mod collection one out there. Moving on to the back side, we'll take a look at our control cavity. It's just your regular one, except for you only have half as many pots. All Gibson branded. A tiny ceramic capacitor there. And the back plate is black. So it matches our whole black and white vibes that we've got going on here. You almost need that circular one right here, even though this particular guitar doesn't need a toggle switch. But we can appreciate our five ply binding on the back because that's about all else we can look at. But what is strange is the bottom strap button is the large one, but the top one's actually the smaller style. But what's really interesting here is the white on the body is slightly different in color to the white on the binding, and that's really only apparent in this area where they meet. And that's the side of the guitar that you don't see, because I would say they blended the colors together much better on this side, as compared to the treble side. But the nice thing about this finish is I still think it'll buff up a little bit, but it would be nowhere near as extreme. Even if I polish this all up, I think it's going to pretty much feel like this its entire life. And when it comes to satin finishes, when I say some of them feel better than others, this is like the cream of the crop, in my opinion. All right, here we go. Double stingers. Now, normally stingers aren't quite that extended. They took some artistic liberties here. But back in the old days, sometimes you would find arch tops that would have a stinger down here and then a stinger at the back of the headstock. That was ultra prestigious. So prestigious that people started using those to hide headstock repairs and heel breaks and stuff. It kind of gives me like playing card vibes. Maybe we need like a checkered board pattern back here. But there we can see our locking Grover tuners, the mod stamp, and this one does not have a demo shop serial number. It's regular custom shop 202189. All said and done, this one's a little bit chunky, 9 pounds, 9.8 ounces. Let's go ahead, plug it in, and hear how it sounds. <laughs> Thank you. 
it goes pretty hard with the 500T in the bridge. You can do whatever you want, but you can also play around with the clean tones. <laughs> wants to distort my amps. That's why I kind of have a, a love-hate relationship with it. Like when you're trying to do crazy buckethead style stuff, it really excels. But when you want it super clean, you really have to roll it down. Now that we know all about this weird mod collection guitar, one of my final thoughts on this one, I've really come to appreciate this guitar. It's the neck profile that really sells it to me on top of the really cool aesthetics here. I mean, when you're playing this guitar, I mean, you get some white, you get some black. I mean, it's just all of the colors. It really reminds me of like a, a Mad Hatter type thing or playing cards, something like that. But yet you get a little bit of Buckethead influence as well as just, you know, regular cool Les Paul custom. So I would highly suggest checking this one out. However, I mean, is kind of a, a one-off. There's only going to be one. There might be other guitars that are similar to that, but if you can at least play a one pickup Les Paul Custom someday, give it a try. It's not for everybody. I'm not going to lie to you about that. Sometimes even I do miss the neck pickup. However, you can't deny that there's not a different feel to just having one, not being able to choose, just being able to hammer into the guitar. So I had a great time with this one. I'm glad I picked it up to document. If you're interested in being the next owner of it, you can check it out on my website, trogleysguitarshow.com. Com. All right, thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.